it's okay to be different and have all these layers because I think it makes you more interesting and it's okay to be different. Welcome to Learning From Experience, a podcast for college students and recent grads who want to hear directly from alumni on how they've adjusted their lives post-graduation, including personal stories of success, career readiness, and tips for navigating the real world. Created by the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Arizona State University. I'm your host, Megan Finnerty, and today I'm talking with Judge Alicia Sears. A little bit about our guest, she graduated from the college in 2017 with a degree from the School of Politics and Global Studies. While at ASU, she worked as a legislative assistant in the Arizona legislature. Then in 2018, Alicia ran for Justice of the Peace in the West Mesa Justice Court. She won, and she was the youngest person elected into state office that year. Being elected also made her one of three African-American women ever to hold the position of Justice of the Peace in Arizona history. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for coming on. My pleasure. Happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Megan. Let's start off easy. What is the Justice of the Peace and what does a day look like in your position? So a Justice of the Peace is a limited jurisdiction judge. So you would basically think of us as the community court. So if you get a traffic ticket, if you're getting an eviction, if you want to get married, you're typically going to go to a Justice of the Peace. So I'm seeing class one and class three misdemeanors, like I said, evictions, civil up to $10,000, uh, traffic. So we do 90% of all the court cases in the state of Arizona. That sounds like a busy work day. How many cases do you see per day? So, yes, it, it is a lot of work. It's one of the busiest courts in Maricopa County. Uh, I would say on a day-to-day basis, I'm seeing at least 30 people. I mean, it, it really ebbs and flows, but um, I'm seeing, yeah, hundreds of people a month, definitely. <laughs> well, what led you to this career? Did you always see yourself running for office? I did not see this for myself. It, it kind of happened in a, a funny way. So I come from a family that's very into public service, helping people, et cetera. Um, but I actually went to school, like the, the global studies degree, right? So I did exchange programs. I, I took classes. I mean, I really had amazing professors um, in global studies. So Dr. Charles Ripley, Dr. Minnie Kittleson, um, just really great people to learn from and get you excited about what's going on. Um, So as I got to the end of my degree program, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to look into the foreign service because eventually I was thinking about becoming an ambassador. Uh, But I fell into local politics by working at the legislature. My mom had ran for office two years prior and won her election to the school board and became the first person of color ever elected to the Mesa Public School Board, which is the largest school board in the state of Arizona. So it's funny because people always ask me, oh, was it because of your mom? I'm like, no, I was I was in college. I was focused on my degree. I was going a totally different direction. I never planned on being local. I always wanted to work on diplomacy with other countries and things like that. But through a, a couple of different experiences, like the private prison ordinance being passed in Mesa, that was one of the, the catalysts. Another catalyst was when I was actually working at uh, the Capitol. There were a lot of kids that came to the Capitol one day and they were setting up chairs. And I thought that was a little bit odd because they're clearly in middle school. They should be in school. It didn't look like they were actually participating in an event. So I asked another legislator, hey, you know, what's going on with these kids? And they said, oh, they're here from the kid prison. And so I was totally confused and offended. And I was very upset. And my my mother happened to be at the Capitol that day. And I told her like, hey, like, I can't believe this is happening. Like, this is so wrong. Because if we're going to have kids at the Capitol, they should be there to learn and learning about the legislative process. We have all these events all the time. Like, why can't they be included? It shouldn't be like, that's their outing. They, they sit up chairs and go home. And she just looked at me. And she said, well, what are you going to do about it? Like, are you going to run for office or not? <laughs> So um, I was looking at applying for law school. Um, So I was like, well, like if I run and I don't make it, then I can go to law school. Um, But I'm I'm not really sure. At first I told her like, hey, like, I don't think like that's something I should be doing. Like if you look, you know, it's all older white men. Like I don't look like what a judge looks like. Right. And she said, well, you know, that only changes if you do something about it. So 
I just started observing in the courts and I decided to file my paper and the rest is history. I love that mom motivation that really kicked in as you're telling that story. And also just the idea that you went from your title being a student to being, you know, an honorable judge in (laughs) one year. So you've clearly experienced um, success on a professional front and you're doing important work in the community and you're making a difference. But I'd love to talk about how you find balance between who you are as a public figure and also who you are outside of work. So how would you describe kind of both sides of yourself? It's funny because a lot of times my friends and a family will be, you know, out doing something or talking about something and they're like, you're a judge. Like, remember you're a judge. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. Because yes, like I am a judge. It's my job. I I love what I do. Um, but I, I still very much am st- like I'm the same person. Like I didn't just like change because I became a judge. So I still do, you know, a lot of the things that I did before. Um, I like to think I'm a creative person, not art wise, but one of the things I do for my work-life balance is I do a lot of yoga. I'm actually getting my certification, my 200 hour certification. Uh, I also do belly dancing. You know, I like to go out with friends. I, I travel a lot. Like I very much am serious about the international relations thing. I love language. I love culture. I love just going out there and obviously the food. I eat a lot of food. So I would say that's kind of how I keep myself balanced. (laughs) On the professional side, how do you prepare or approach working in a position of power and in community service? I think the most important thing to me is just keeping an open mind, understanding that not everybody has your same lived experience, not making assumptions, not taking things personally. Um, So, I mean, you know, when people come to court, they're not always in the best mood. Uh, so I just try to give them grace and meet them where they're at and see if there's anything I can do to make their experience more positive. Um, because you know, you're already, there's already power dynamic. Like I'm sitting up there, you're down there, you're there because allegedly you've done something, um, that you need to answer for. So there's no need to further create that divide. Um, I think it's important that you do work together. And I, I tell people, especially when they're we're really, really upset, I say, hey, you know, sir, ma'am, you know, whoever, um, we are all here to help you. And I want to make sure that I'm getting the information I need in order to give you the best service. So, you know, just kind of massaging them and getting them to... Uh, get more relaxed. And I mean, I've even had people send me flowers to the court saying, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to to speak with me and, and work on my case. So I think that definitely shows that I care and that I put a lot of work into building that empathy um, into what I do because not everybody does. And it's not like you have to, but I think that is the right thing to do. I feel like anytime somebody takes on a new job, there is an opportunity for change. How have you seen yourself grow? It definitely is like drinking from a fire hose, like going from, you know, teaching third and fourth grade kids all day long to going to judicial college. And it's been a lot, especially with all the different personalities you meet, not only in the courtroom, but also staffing wise. Like I'd never been a supervisor before. So I literally went from never, you know, having overseen a team to having a staff of 10 people. Um, that all happened very quickly and your training is essentially like four months long. That's very intense where you are going to classes and then eventually you're on the bench, you're observing, um, then you're, you're kind of like making some decisions. Then there's a, the mentor judge is there with you and is watching you make decisions, basically guiding you along the way. So it's, it's a lot. It definitely has expanded my mind in the way that I, I just operate through the world for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely have grown a lot. I mean, when I was elected, I was 24. Um, I'm 29 now, so I'm, I'm pushing 30. So a lot, a lot has changed, especially like in my, my personal life and things like that. I did want to mention, this is a professional slash personal accomplishment because it's related. Um, I went to the 114th annual National NAACP 
convention in Boston, Massachusetts, and I was selected as a speaker. So that was actually my first national speaking engagement, and I spoke to the youth and college division. So I was on a panel with uh, another, uh, like two other elected officials. One was a councilman um, from the East Coast, and the other one was a 19-year-old mayor who's the the youngest mayor that's ever been elected in U.S. history. He comes from a, a small town called Earl in Arkansas. So it was definitely a very interesting uh, panel. I was the only woman, uh, but that's kind of how it goes. <laughs> well, congratulations. That is a huge honor. And I think what stands out about your story is how you've managed your time for what's important to you while also growing your professional career. What advice do you have for students to have work-life balance? I would just say, please, like, get some hobbies. Like, don't just, you know, be working on your papers all the time. And even, you know, post-graduation, just like, oh, what's next? What can I accomplish next? Because I totally get that mindset because, like, I've been there. I still always am, like, reaching higher and seeing what I can achieve. But you're not just what you can achieve. You're not just your accomplishments. Like, you do have value just you as as it is just being here, just existing is a beautiful thing. Go back and think about the things you liked as a kid. That's what a lot of people tell me your 30s is about. And I mean, you you don't have to wait till you're 30. You can start now. You make time for the things that are important to you. And at the end of the day, the most important thing is pouring into your own cup. Because if you, like me, like I have a lot of people who depend on me, uh, not just staff or family or friends, like th- there's just a lot that's asked of me. Um, especially where I'm at. And if I don't take care of myself first and pour into myself, like there's just no way that I can serve others. So always serve yourself first because you are the most important person in your life. That's so true. And taking care of yourself really does need to be a priority. So as you're looking towards your future, do you have any ideas of what you'd like it to look like? Yeah. So when it comes to the yoga, which is funny because I started doing that when I was at ASU because there were free classes that were offered. So I would just go whenever I had time um, and I felt like leaving my dorm room. Um, but that was super awesome. So I carried that with me to the pandemic because everyone was trying to figure out, you know, how to do mental wellness in these uncertain times and unprecedented times. Um, but I ended up joining a studio once it was safe to be in person. And at first I was just like, oh, you know, I want to continue building up through exercise and everything. Uh, but the more I did it, I realized that a lot of people can benefit from yoga and meditation and breath work. And a lot of people don't see it as accessible. So I decided to go into the yoga teacher training. And when I started it, I wasn't sure what that was going to look like for me at the end. Uh, But now I'm less than three weeks from being done. And what I've decided to do is literally go forward with having a yoga business. So my goal is to specifically target uh, executives, um, people who are like high level in their companies and as well, uh, political candidates and current elected officials, uh, because I feel especially at these high levels where we're managing teams, you know, we have to make a lot of important decisions. People always talk about mental health this, mental health that, like nobody's watching a mental health seminar that's being hosted by their job and saying, yep, I'm all better now. Like that's not, that's not real life. And I think we, we all know that. Um, So what I want to do is essentially be a yoga consultant and go to these different companies and organizations and say, hey, you know, we can do sessions, whether it's in a big group or like retreats where we we actually go off site um, and go out of their actual offices and go somewhere that's more relaxing and, and do a type of team retreat where we're engaging in those activities. So they're able to take that with them, one, knowing that, hey, I can move my body that way. Like this is something that is accessible to me, but also being able to pass it on to their employees. Like I know a lot of people do employee retreats as well. Um, but I think that it starts from the top down, right? So you kind of have to to change your mindset. And I think it's important that we, as people who are making these very important decisions, you know, have our uh, faculties about 
ourselves and can operate in an efficient manner that's that's good for everyone. So I'm super excited for what that holds. And it's gonna go from the boardroom to the the halls of Congress. It's gonna it's gonna be good because there's nobody like me. There's no other 29 year old judge out here <laughs> being a yoga teacher judge. <laughs> I love it. You're making a difference and maintaining your identity. To those listening, thank you so much for joining us today and listening to Alicia's experience. If you'd like to connect with her, you can on Instagram at Sears for Justice would be her judge account. And then for her yoga work, she's at the extraordinary lay, lay spelled L-E-I. To hear more alumni advice, head to our page wherever you listen to podcasts. You can check out the college's YouTube channel or visit thecollege.asu.edu slash LFE podcast.